Hello, welcome back to another one of my videos. Today I want to talk about Alteryx macros, applications, and chained applications. When I first looked at this topic to present to you, I was building an advanced application that involved macros and chained applications as well. And I realized that within the discussion of that workflow and the creation of that workflow, it'd be very easy to miss the point that I wanted to make in the video. And that is, I wanted to highlight the strengths of macros and applications, some of the gotchas or weaknesses of macros and applications and how to overcome them or look out for them. And I wanted to hone in on how you can use these to make your workflows more flexible, more powerful, and also much easier to develop. And so rather than build an application to highlight all these, I decided that it actually just made sense to specifically create some very tiny little workflows to show you where the powers and shortcomings and differences between these advanced Alteryx workflow types. Whenever I talk about macros and applications and chained applications, I'm never sure whether to begin with macros and then talk about applications, or talk about applications and then talk about macros. But I always hold out chained applications until last. So this video, I decided it made sense to start with macros. And so that's what we're going to do. So let's start this short series off by diving into macros. Hopefully you'll be able to understand how you can use macros and you'll feel comfortable with creating your own macro and making your development much more productive. While I am sure that you can come up with a thousand and one usage for macros once you have a good understanding of how macros can help you, I just wanted to look at a couple of generalizations for how I envision using macros. So we'll look at using a macro for a repetitive or standard calculation. In every business, there are standard calculations that are done in a lot of your reporting as well in a lot of your data cleanup and streaming and blending. One that comes to mind quite frequently through a number of different industries has to do with length of stay. Exactly how do you calculate length of stay? Do you include the first day and the last day? Do you include just the first day and not the last day? The answer to these questions should come from your business. But once that question has been answered, you really want everyone to use that exact same calculation. And this is where a macro can come in to do that calculation so not everybody has to learn the algorithm. And if you have a centralized place to serve these, you can store them and people can load them and use them within their individual workflows. Alteryx has a gallery that provides just such a functionality. We're going to look at a much simpler calculation than length of stay. And all that we're going to want to look at doing is taking some basic input. And I always like to use just sort of a test case for all of this. And we're going to use a string. We're going to call this one. I'm going to take an integer and we'll call that a one. And to show how this repeats through a workflow, we'll do a two and a two. And very, sim very simply, all that I want to do is to take these two data types and I'll put a select on here to make sure they become what I want them to become. In this case, this doesn't need to be a fixed length but basically a variable string 
of let's say 50. And my integer, I want it to be an integer. And the simple calculation that I want to do We'll add a column. We'll call this new text. We'll make this a V string of 100. And all I want to do is to take the, and we'll make this bigger so you can see it. And we'll add to it. And we'll add to it the conversion of that number to a string. Take an int integer. Give it zero for decimal places. And we'll go ahead and run this. Let's put a browse on the end of it just for the completeness of making this a workflow. And you see that we get out is a 1 with a 1 and a 2 with a 2. Since this is going to become a standard macro, it's good to actually put a comment in here. Concat string and integer. Pretty simple calculation, but if it's repetitive, we want to do it the same way because a lot of questions of how many digits do you allocate to it, what do you do with it if it's not an integer, etc, etc. But in this case, we're going to keep it very simple. As you can see, this runs a string and an integer. So what we want to do now is to turn this into a macro. Well, this macro is going to need a stream of data coming into it so it can calculate the concatenation for each row. So to do that, we go to our interface. And again, apps and macros share this space of interfaces. Dragging in any of the macro interfaces turns this into a macro workflow and dragging in any of the application widgets turns this into an application. And in this case, what we want to do is bring some output in. And you see that it needs to have some standard to understand what it's supposed to come in and what it's supposed to look like. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and edit data. And this is going to be called the string. This is going to be called the integer. And as a test case, we're going to use any and 99. We attach that into this flow once we delete this one. What this says is that this flow of data will go into our select. And if you notice, since we changed the names, we have a few things to clean up. We're going to go ahead and say forget the missing fields and change these back as we had done before. Probably couldn't make life easier by giving them the same name. But what's the fun in showing you how to develop a workflow without having to do some modifications? Looks good, but then of course our formula is not correct. And that's actually one of the simpler things to change. We just bring in the string. 
and bring in the integer. And now we have our browse. Nice thing about this is that we can still run this and it will take the template that we developed in order to run the workflow. So we can take a look and see that it's still working properly. We want this data flow to go back into the workflow that called the macro. So we stick a macro output onto the end of it. So data stream will come in, we'll do the calculation and a data stream will go out. So we're going to take a look at how this appears, but first we need to save it. Makes it a little bit easier to work with updates. So let's go ahead and save. I am saving this into one of my two macro subdirectories that I have defined. One is macros and one is this work in progress. I'm going to call this macro one because it's what I've been working on. So now to call this macro, we need to create another workflow. So let's go ahead and use our text input. We'll call this first column A, the second column B, just for lack of anything. We'll call this 1, 2, 3, and 4. We'll give this the same numbers. Put a select on here. And we're not actually going to change anything in the select just so you can see how the macro operates. So we have a string and we have a byte. And what I want to do is to send this data into the macro so it will concatenate these two together. And I do that, I right click and I say insert. Because I've defined these two directories as being macro directories, they actually appear here so I can look at any of the macros that I have in here. And there's macro one. Also down here at macro, it'll show any macros that I currently have open inside of Altrix, in this case, macro one. Two different ways you can get to the macro, depending upon where you're working. When you define the macro, let's go ahead and drop a browse onto the end of it so we can see what the output data looks like. Better than that, let's drop a select in there as well. And you see that we need to link up the two fields that are necessary for our workflow to work properly inside of the macro. And that is the fact that we had the string. I need to identify which column of the input workflow should be associated with the string. And then the second one is the integer. And I need to know which column or field in my inbound workflow matches up. In that case, it is B. Everything looks good. We can run this. And you can see from the output that we now have the string, the integer, and then new text which was generated. And the data types has been changed to match what they are within that workflow. So this is important to understand how your flow is going to see that because we are associating two different columns into our macro, they will take on the name and the attributes of what's going on within that macro. So essentially these fields have changed their names and data types within this stream. Now why you cannot change the data type, well you can but we won't go to that much of an extreme. We can however go ahead and fix what's going on within the naming to put their names back. We cannot rename the fields going into the formula, otherwise the formula will, will fail, but we can rename the fields coming out of the formula. If you notice, there is a Q on the bottom of this input. The Q there means that we can go into our interface, choose the important action, which modifies work, and we take the lightning bolt into the lightning bolt over here on this final select. And the default action that comes up is to say update select with reverse field map. What this means is it will give the fields back their name that they started with. So now we can go ahead and run this. Well, first we need to save this so that the most current version of this macro comes into our workflow. Alteryx tells us it's changed. Do you want to update it? And the answer is absolutely. So now when I run this, you see that I've gone back to 
A and B as their names. New text is what we gave as the output and is a V string and an integer which is the data type that was associated with it after it was operated into the macro. Which is fine because V strings, bytes, etc. If I need to, I can make any additional changes in this select when I come out of here, but I just don't want to have to remember which field was which and to change their names back to what we started with. The second thing to bring up about how all this works is if I add a column C, which is just some random characters these fields or this field C is not accounted for within this workflow macro that I'm calling but when I run this you'll see that C has been passed through so even though it just operated on A and B C was unknown to the macro but it is known to the workflow because of this field that's associated with each of your workflows, which is called the unknown. And so what this does is that any fields that come into our macro will be used as this unknown and will appear simply as themselves and they'd be passed on to the output so that no fields are lost through the macro. So this is a very nice way to handle those repetitive calculations so you don't have to code them every single time that they need to be done. It also shows you both the power of the macro in passing fields along and containing what you need as well as one of the limitations that you need to be aware of which is changes to names or attributes, attributions of your fields within the macro will be sustained coming out of the flow on the other side. So another behavior of macros that can be very useful to you involves executing them in a recursive process. What this means is that if you pass more than one record into a control parameter, the macro will execute once for each of those records. So this gives you the ability to create some type of data set that then allows that macro to run more than one time and it runs independently with only the output being a consolidated workflow. To highlight this, we'll do a few more tweaks to the macros that we've been working on with this data set. So if you remember this simple little process, I have coming in some text input, process it, and then send it back out the other end. And I've been dropping macros in here. If we go ahead and load our macro 1, if you remember correctly what this does is it concatenates our two columns. So let's drop that macro into this workflow again. Here's macro one, drop it in here, link it up, the string, and the integer. We run this, and you can see that we indeed have concatenated column A and column B together. So let's modify this macro a little bit in that what we will do is in our formula not only concatenate this together but also add into it this text string or add to the end of it the text string ABC.
So if we were to run this manually, you see that what comes out of it now is the text string, the number, and now ABC at the very end. So it's not too bright things have been working on. We're going to go ahead and save this macro as well. This is going to be macro 2, but since I already have a copy of it out there, I do not want to lose this copy. We'll call this 2A. So now we have a new macro that does a little bit more work. Put that in the middle. Save it one more time. So here we'll delete this macro. And we'll insert macro 2. Connects the same way as the previous macro. We must give it a string. And we must give it a number. Now when we run this one, you can see now that it gives us our four records coming out concatenated with ABC at the end. So if we want to make the assumption now that what we want to do is to actually allow ABC to be a parameter coming into this, so we will go ahead and go back into our interfaces and now we have control parameter. This is another macro input. And just give this a name. Let's call this final text. And the action that we want to take with final text is here in our formula. And again, the primary reason that you go into macros is the fact that you can alter the processing through actions. And in this case, we look through the parameters that we have out here. We have within our formula. So each formula field would appear up here with the actual expression. So we want to modify a piece of this expression. And what we want to do down here is replace a specific string. And then even though typically I just say edit rather than create again, but in this case, ABC is very simple. So here in this string, the ABC will be changed to whatever text we pass in through the control parameter. We'll go ahead and save this. That will automatically ask us to update. And now you notice that not only do we have our flow into it, we also have a place for control parameters to be satisfied. And so in this case, we'll go ahead and put this same flow into our control parameters. Editing this, it asks us whether or not we want to group this data down in order to reduce the amount of data coming in, something I have not really found a use case for. But again, choose a field, the final text. Let's go ahead and choose C, which is our string. So now rather than concatenating on to an ABC on to the string, we'll concatenate whatever this control perimeter has, which is the different values of C which is double A, double B, double C, and double D. But what you will see happens when we run this is how this rec executed recursively. If we look at the log file down here, you see that there were four iterations of this macro that were run. So this macro actually ran four times. And as I work on this workflow and do some more things to it, I want to go into my runtime I want to show all macro messages so the next time we run this. If there are any additional messages in that macro, they will appear here as well. But if we look at the output set, what we now have is not just four records, but this ran four times, which gives us 16 records. So the one workflow, well, the workflow for the first iteration had AAA, AA appended to it. The second iteration, it had BB etc. as we went through there. So it actually ran four times with this workflow, the data flow going into it, and then put out 16 records at the other time because it executed with the entire suite of data four separate times. Now, so we're going to go ahead and create another recursive macro that shows you a little bit better usage of this macro. And that has to do with
querying data out of a database. A lot of times if you're trying to run a query for a specific set of data, it might be too expensive and you're trying to get a range of data or a range of values out of it and executing data, for example, for one day is very cheap, but if you wanted to run multiple days, it becomes more expensive as well as you're not exactly sure how many you want to run. So I found that using a macro to do that query is pretty simple. So we're going to go ahead and load my macro 3 so that we don't go into the trouble of, of creating this one because it is pretty simple. Here's macro 3. So what macro 3 has in it is embedded a select xxx, just basically a text string from a table. And what I want to do is change that XXX as we go through it, just to show you how recursively this changes. So if I run this directly, this select as test string from my table returns me one record, which is the test string of XYZ. But coming into it, I want to go ahead and pass a control parameter that will update that XXX and run the query for each one. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. So what we want to do here is go ahead and delete this macro off. I'm going to insert this new macro that will query the database according to the control parameter. So now I actually stick the control parameter. Let's make it that C string that we were working with before. If we run this, and if we look at the log, you see that each of these, qu this query ran four times with a different text string that we passed in as a control parameter. And so then our output is as text string those four records, which are the results set from running that query four different times based on the control parameter. So this is the way that you can continue to expand your productivity and use macros in order to run recursively depending upon the number of records that you have generated in a stream and passing them into the macro and having it process multiple times. And sort of to wrap it all up about what you use macros for, and that is simply to give you programmatic control of a predefined process so that in a good programming world you create a set of subroutines that you pass parameters into those sub subroutines do a standard piece of work that has been predefined and verified so that you don't have to code it every time you're trying to do it it might take you a little bit longer to build the initial macro but if you use that macro every day with a new workflow, the time is quickly recouped. So this final example is a simplified version of a macro that I was using and continue to use in developing my Little Daisy Hill Data Mart and Data Lake. And this is one where the predefined process is very simple and in fact it is only one widget but this widget will create a table because it's the output widget and it also creates the primary key so that so I don't have to continue to remember how to create this widget putting in the post create SQL statement with the proper syntax every time it is much easier for me to make this a macro and now these different components might make more sense to you than possibly the first time you saw me use such a macro and that is I bring in my input stream I rename the connecting column to its original name so that none of the field names change going forward. We also input the name of the table and that gets modified or used to modify the output widget in two places. One is within the file name. It has the actual table name so I'll modify the ZZ top with the new table name. The second place 
is when I alter the table in order to create the primary key. And again, I'm going to replace the stub version with ZZ top of the table name with the table name that I passed in. And then finally, it needs to know the list of primary key columns. And then it also replaces the existing stub, which is input WID, with the columns that you passed into it. So then while I don't have to remember the exact syntax, all I have to do is remember to pass it my data stream, my table name, and my primary key columns. And this will create myself a new table. And I don't have to worry about it time after time of either recreating this widget or cutting pasting it from a common location. So be sure to subscribe to my channel. Drop me any comments that you might have. Also put any questions about macros that you might be running into because they really will make your life easier and you shouldn't be afraid of using them. It just takes a bit of understanding and a bit of practice. Hopefully these examples will follow you as you go through your journey. Thanks.